have my slides? Yes. Cool. Well, thanks everybody uh, for coming up so early. I know like the night has been long uh, yesterday night. So today I'm going to talk about uh, video editing in the browser. So my name is Christopher Shiloh, and you may have seen me in the movie about React uh, uh, on the first day. And I'm French. And so unfortunately, we didn't won, uh, win the World Cup uh, last time. Like Frank Lindo, like was able to do it, but yeah, cool. So since COVID, I started uh, like uh, doing like more video editing and like watching YouTube and everything. And so I started like really like going deep and serious into it. And so as you can see, like with all of my views, like I should not leave my job to be a YouTuber yet. <laughs> So how how, the, how does it work? So what I did was to uh, start like investing in like a twenty dollar green screen, and uh, starting to do uh, using Final Cut Pro to do video editing. And the thing that was really annoying is like it felt like all of the latest developments uh, was not there. So for example, for the green screen, I needed to like actually pick the green color and like select the ranges of colors. And it didn't work really well, like uh, with the background, with the shadow, and everything. Same for like uh, the when I edit videos, I want to see like, hey, what am I actually talking about, and what's the interesting thing? But I only get sound waves uh, for spoken words, and I really want to see like the actual text. And the good thing is, uh, I was like looking at uh, the web, and like Yuna's team has been doing an amazing job in the Chrome, like to actually build all the APIs. And so we can do video ed uh, editing in the web. So with web codec and uh, for background, background removal, we can use TensorFlow.js. Uh, for text, uh, speech to text, we can have like the Whisper uh, API from OpenAI has been uh, translated to C++ and then uh, ported to Wasm. So like we have all of the building blocks. And so I was like, yep, I'm going to do it. I'm going to like write a video editor in the web. And unfortunately, it was not a smooth sailing. And I came in with some like ideas of like how it would work, but in practice they would turn out to be false. So for example, like I thought that like time only travels forwards. I also saw that decoding one frame gives you one frame back. And finally, I thought that Wasm was faster than JavaScript for video decoding. And so in this talk today, I'm going to uh, walk through like all of this journey that I went through and uh, let you know like why those three things that I thought were true were not. So let's start with uh, stating the problem. So we have like this like super cool like React Miami video, uh, which is like some text and like a palm tree, and uh, the palm tree fades out and the React Miami like comes in. So what do I want to do? Like the very first step I was thinking is okay, I'm going to load the video. So I'm going to uh, take a file on the file system, load it, and I was expecting to get a list of images back. And then I'm going to modify those images. I'm going to like apply the uh, background removal. I'm going to do cross fades and those kind of things. And then I'm going to like want to save the video. So I was expecting an API, take a file, like a file name, and then uh, like a list of new images and it's going to save it. So unfortunately it didn't work that way. And so the first, like the, the reason why is, um, let's start thinking about uh, what is actually an image and how is it like encoded? How is it stored? So for this, this is like uh, an image and like uh, it's uh, 1024 by 1280. So like very typical size, like not super big, not super small. And so now let's think like how big is this actually in the file system? So uh, we have all of, so if you have a rectangle, you want to know like how many pixels you multiply like the width by the height. And then you get like 1.3 megabyte just for this. And then uh, you probably know that like images are encoded like using red, green, and blue, or you can other things, but this is the most common. And so now we are already at like four megabytes. And so this is for just for one image. And now if you want to actually make a video, you need to have like many images per second. And so if we use like 60 FPS, now we are like at 200 megabytes per second. And so now you can probably start seeing where I'm going with this. Like if we use the API that I talked about, like you're going to run out of memory like very, very, very quickly. So this didn't work. And like a lot of smart people were like working on the problem like from like many decades. And the first thing that you're trying to like thinking about is like, okay, I'm going to like start compressing the video, uh, the images. And so we need like a shrinking machine. 
So this is uh, the interesting part. Like I'm going to go through like many uh, like specific details of like how image compression work and like video compression work. And in practice, like I wish we didn't need to know about all of this, but right now all of the APIs are designed around them. And so this is why in this talk, I'm going to go through like we do a very quick primer around like all of those techniques. You don't have to fully understand them, but you should be aware of like how they work at a high level. So let's start with uh, thinking about uh, the image as a list of pixels. So in this case, like the palm tree, like the edge uh, of the palm tree is a few black pixels and a few white pixels. So the first idea that comes to mind in order to compress it is instead of saying like, oh, there's like five white pixels in a row and seven white pixels in a row, like uh, white pixel, white pixel, white pixel, what you can do is start encoding, oh, there's five, the number five, like one number, and then like three values for uh, the white pixel. And so this way, instead of like uh, three values for white, three value for white, three value for white, you can have like one value for the number and then uh, the pixels. And so this is called run length encoding, RLE. And so this is very useful uh, for images that are like, have like many pixels that are look uh, like each other. So like all time printers and everything. But in practice, if you're uh, using like a photograph uh, of this, like you're never going to get like exactly the same pixel like in a row. And so people had to find like other ways. And so this next one is going to be uh, a bit out there. And so you're going to want to think about the image, not as like individual pixels, but as a function, as a signal. And so you can represent uh, your image as a continuous function. Like if you've done math, uh, this is like, should uh, re like have some uh, like reminders. And one of the interesting theorem that was proven is that you can decompose any uh, continuous function into a sum of many sin and cos functions. And so there's an algorithm called uh, the fast Fourier transform that lets you do it. So now why, like, why do we want this? And so the interesting thing is each of the cos and sine function uh, is basically like takes the same amount of bytes to encode. And so it has the same amount of information. And so what you can also realize is like the first uh, few uh, sine and cos functions contain like way more like information that like make the shape uh, of the overall function. And then the more you go, the more it's going to be like very small variations. And so what you can do is uh, to start converting this original signal into this series uh, of sinus and cosinus function, and then just skip and ignore uh, everything but the first few ones and then re-encode it back. And so this way you're able to uh, get a very similar like looking image, but remove a lot of information and like have less bytes. So again, if you don't understand like the full mathematical detail and everything, this is fine, but you need to understand like uh, the concepts. And the third uh, one, like the third uh, image composition I'm going to talk to uh, that you need to like have in mind is now instead of thinking of it as like pixel or instead of thinking of it as a continuous function, now we're going to think of it as like zero and one. And one of the things that you may not realize when you're looking at this is uh, the distribution of all of the zeros and ones is not uh, the same. And so in this case, uh, there are 15 times zero, one, zero, one. There are seven times one, one, zero. And then there's a bunch of ones, uh, one, zero, zero, one, that is only one time and a bunch of different that are like only one time. And so now what you can do to compress this is you can start uh, creating a mapping of uh, remapping all of the like binary uh, numbers. And so for example, what you can do is uh, to map 0, 1, 0, 1 to like only one bit, like zero. You can map 1, 1, 0 to like 1, 0. And at some point you do all of this mapping. And so like the one that are like not likely to happen may have like a larger uh, binary representation than uh, what they had originally. But if you sum all of this and uh, plus the actual decoding table, now it's going to actually like uh, let you have an overall size uh, which is smaller. And so this is called Hoffman encoding. So those are like three techniques uh, in order to compress images. And with this, 
uh, we are basically able to get roughly like uh, divided by 10 uh, the size of the image. And so for this, this is image compression and you've probably seen like JPEG, uh, PNG, WebP. So those are like the names uh, you are going to uh, like see and hear. And so now uh, we are able to get to uh, around 20 megabytes per second. So this is much better than like the 200 megabytes per second at the beginning, but unfortunately like it's still like pretty big. So now like the people working on this uh, like had like continued working on this and had more ideas. So now uh, what was like the key idea? So if you look at this video, uh, all of the frames uh, are basically like look very, very similar to the previous frame. And so like we have like 60 React Miami, like nine in this case, uh, transition um, between uh, the two uh, like slides and they look the same. So now uh, the idea of like, how do you actually like compress this? Instead of compressing like every single image independently, now you can start thinking how to compress them in relation with each other. And so for this, the, <coughs> Uh, the main, uh, like the first idea that comes to mind is, well, I'm going to do a diff of what is the first image compared to the second image, and I'm going to only encode the diff uh, that happens. And so with this, you're able to get uh, like uh, sizable wins. But then uh, people realize that in practice uh, for this animation, you can see that the palm tree is like going from uh, this side to this side. And so one thing you can start thinking is like, I can actually predict uh, what is the image going to be on the next frame? And so for this, uh, the algorithm that the people have invented is like a prediction algorithm. So you start predicting from the previous frames where the next frame is going to be. And then you, all, and then you do a diff uh, based on this. And from this diff, you use the previous uh, algorithm to compress that diff. And so this is uh, essentially what a video codec is. And so some video codecs, like the most popular is H264, which is also named AVC, the same way like JavaScript is named ECMAScript in the spec. And then uh, there's a few other ones like AV1 and VP8, VP9. So this is like a video codec. So at this point, uh, what we have is uh, the first frame, which is called the keyframe, which is like basically just JPEG encoding uh, the image. And then uh, you've got like a series of frames that are delta. And again, you get like a 10x factor out of them. So now the way it impacts our uh, API is that in order to uh, decode the second frame, you need to have decoded the first frame. And then in order to decode the third frame, you need to have decoded the second frame. And so now there's a dependency uh, happening. So you cannot decode like an, uh, an arbitrary frame. You need to have decoded like the frames before. And so this is why if you're trying to seek an arbitrary point in a video, in a video file, uh, it can take like some uh, like seconds to actually like redo all of those decoding up until that point. So this is uh, all uh, nice and good, but the people working on video encoding were not done yet. They had more ideas. And one of the uh, key ideas, uh, sorry, one of the key ideas that they had is uh, right now, what we're doing is predicting into the future. But what about uh, if we start from the end, we can also start predicting backwards. And so what they started thinking is, I'm going to uh, try to predict into the future and see what file size I get. I'm going to try to predict in the past what file size I get. And then I'm going to pick the best out of them. And so this way, you can even get like a, a better like a file size compression. Now, for example, in this example, like the, no, the, the slide number, like the image number five is what they call a bi-directional frame or a B-frame. And so in this case, you need to have the frame number four and the frame number six to be decoded in order to decode the frame number five. And so now, as you can see, uh, this starts getting interesting uh, so that like in order to decode frame number five, you need to have like one, two, three, four, and then also like nine, eight, seven, six. And so the way you actually like start uh, encoding this is you're going to like in your file system, you're going to like, sorry, uh, you're going to need to send to the decoder all of those frames like in the right order, you know, to be able to decode like five number, f um, 
uh, frame number five. And so this is uh, another concept you need to understand is there's two uh, notion of timestamps. There's the presentation timestamp, which is the time at which uh, the image is going to be displayed to the user. So this is like the one you're thinking in your head, but there's also the decoding timestamp. So this is uh, the timestamp at which the frame needs to be sent to the decoder in order to decode uh, in a present uh, presentation timestamp. And so as you can see, uh, like the first notion of like time is broken where the decoding timestamp is not actually uh, the same as the presentation timestamp and they're like in different orders. So this is uh, our first like mind banning thing, which is like time doesn't only travel forward. So now we're not done yet. So now like how do we actually make, uh, you, like create and design an API for this? And so uh, now the API is around like, we're going to like load a video and then we're going to create a decoder. And so the great thing is uh, the Chrome and more browser are implementing it right now, are uh, implementing what they call web codecs. And so this is like video decoder and video encoder. And the API is like, it takes uh, a bunch of options and one of them is uh, uh, on decoded frame. And so it gives you uh, a callback when a frame has been decoded. And so what you need to do is to start uh, sending uh, dec uh, like frames in order to the decode function. And so when you send uh, the first frame, then you're going at some point in the future, so it's not synchronous, uh, you're going to get your callback being called with the uh, actual image, like the actual uh, bits uh, and like RGBs for every single pixel. And so you're doing this uh, for the first frame, the second, the third, the fourth, and like everything goes well. But then the next one is like you're going to send uh, frame number nine, frame number eight, frame number seven, number six, and you're never going to get any callback in all of this. And so it's just going to like hang until finally you give it uh, frame number five, and then it's going to like churn the work and everything. And then at some point it's going to give you like five, six, seven, eight, and nine. And so the, the consequences of this is that uh, the mental model where like decoding one frames uh, gives you one frame back doesn't actually hold true. And so this is like mind bending because like, every, like in all of my career when I called a function, it gave me a, uh, a value back like instantly or like some delay, but like always gave me something back. But in this case, uh, we can be like, oh, you're just feeding stuff. And at some point, maybe in the future, it's going to give you uh, other values. So this is um, like, this is the second one. And now the interesting thing is uh, because like we have to give frames in a different order and everything. Now there's a, basically a lot of metadata that accumulates and we need to store it somehow. So it's not longer just the frames, but like there's a lot of information such as, for example, like, is it a key frame? Is it a Delta frame? Uh, what is the like uh, frame duration? And uh, like, what are the differences between the frames? And so if we were to build it in like 2023, like we would probably use JSON. Now all of those video encoding and like all of this space has like started like 20, 30 years ago. And uh, they use like binary encoding, but in practice, uh, you can think of this as like basically a JSON uh, format. And, uh, and with one particular, it is that there's some binary data, which is like the compressed version and the Delta versions uh, that is uh, inside of this. And so for example, like, oh, the encoded frame, like the first one is like a 400 kilobytes uh, blob of data and uh, like all of the Delta, like, I don't know, like 40 kilobytes. And so this uh, file, uh, this kind of files is called a video container. And so this is something you're probably like more familiar with, uh, such as like MP4, uh, Move, AVI, MKV. And so this is how do you encode all of this metadata that's eventually going to be passed to uh, the decoder. And so one other thing which is uh, interesting about this is the, there's many different uh, file formats like video containers, and all of them uh, have different ways of encoding things and like uh, different uh, uh, like names, but they do like very similar things. So at this point, 
uh, we need to think and talk about about performance. So I told you uh, that like video encoding and decoding is like really performance intensive. And so in practice, the part that's very performance intensive is uh, doing this uh, all of the compression, decompression that I talked about. Uh, this is like manipulating the binary data. And so this is uh, one thing I was thinking about is like, okay, can we use like uh, Wasm to start using it and everything? But in practice, uh, the industry today, you know, to get like the best performance uh, for video encoding and decoding, uh, the hardware, like on your CPU, has dedicated operations that are implemented on the GPU to do those operations, like Hoffman encoding, like uh, 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 fast Fourier transform and everything. Like there's literally like hardware uh, dedicated for this. And so if you just write C++ and re-implement them in C++, it's going to be an order of magnitude slower than using the hardware uh, accelerated version. And so the magic of web codec is it like it lets you use the actual hardware uh, to do those operations. And so this is why like uh, I'm super excited and now we can actually do like proper like video editing on the web is because of the web codec API. Now, uh, the thing if you're trying to do it in JavaScript, like first, like even in C++, like if you use FFmpeg, it's going to use the hardware and like the C++ is going to be slower. And then if you use WebAssembly, there's another like overhead uh, happening on top. And so this is why we should like use uh, Java, uh, like JavaScript and uh, web uh, codecs to use that. And like, it doesn't make sense to use a uh, web assembly for this. The second aspect of performance, uh, which is interesting is like, oh, you need to actually pass all of this. You need to decode all of this and you need to start sending uh, all of this data to uh, the, web, uh, the web codecs. And one of the thing is, okay, so web assembly is faster. So, uh, why, like, uh, shouldn't, shouldn't I use JavaScript? And so for this, uh, first, in terms of, like, what is the amount of time spent in this? So if you can see, like, each line is, like, I don't know, like, tens of characters, but the binary data is, like, hundreds of, like, hundreds of kilobytes. And so, like, the overhead of each line is, like, completely negligible. So even if you're, like, spending, like, 10x the amount of time uh, passing this, like, it really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. So writing JavaScript and the JavaScript engine are like pretty fast right now. So this is not a big bottleneck, but even more so, the way WebAssembly works is uh, you basically recreate an entire memory space, like which is the C uh, memory space with malloc. Uh, and then what you're doing is you're uh, sending all of this data from the JavaScript memory space to the WebAssembly memory space. Then you do your computation and then you send it back. And so as I mentioned here, like we're talking about like pretty big files even with after compression. And so even if uh, the uh, running in WebAssembly, uh, the code to pass all of this, you still have to send it to web codec. So you still have to send it back to JavaScript. And so now you have to do like a big copy, like two big copies in order to be able to use it. So in practice, it's like, uh, slower to uh, run uh, this operation, which is called uh, demuxing uh, in the jargon. So you'll probably have to uh, uh, know about it if you're implementing anything about this. And so this is why. So this is why it's actually uh, faster to use pure JavaScript uh, to do uh, video decoding in the browser. Now, one thing I want to note is that uh, WebAssembly still has a role to play. Because as I mentioned with demuxing, like we're talking about a bunch of video file formats, uh, like video containers, uh, file formats, and have like a lot of like complexity. And there's been like for the past like 30 years, a lot of C libraries that have implemented this and are battle tested and are very robust. And in the JavaScript, like this is just in the nascent C. And so one of the uh, use of uh, WebAssembly is for code reuse. So we can actually convert and compile all of these like battle-tested C libraries into JavaScript, into Wasm, in order to be able to use it. So now I've gone uh, through uh, like most of the like talk and everything, and like I don't know about you, but I was like pretty disappointed. I was like aiming to like basically like change the world, like make the best video editor, like uh, start a new YouTuber career, and 
I barely got like video encoding uh, working. So uh, what I want you to get out of this talk is first, uh, I created like an end-to-end -end solution that is actually doing like full video encoding, uh, decoding and re-encoding. And uh, right now it clocks at around like 500 lines of code. And so, but this is working. And so this is something that like at some point, uh, if you want to like play around and everything, now you can get something working and you can like start prototyping with it. So this is like uh, good. And the second thing that I've done with this is I've like, proven that it actually works. And so the uh, decoding and encoding process, I timed it against Final Cut Pro, and this is like almost the same time. And so like all of the like browser APIs and like are fast and are solid. And so now you can build like all of the cool stuff I wanted like on top of this. But the thing I want is like even more is like to challenge you. I want to challenge like every single one of you to like start taking what I did and build like basically the jQuery of video editing. So turning like those 500 lines of code, uh, turning like you need to understand like all of the concepts I've showed you uh, into like, yep, I can just uh, create, use an API that's like, hey, loads a video, like do a video transform steps and like save the video and like everything just works. So this is my challenge to you and this is the end of my talk. Thank you.